issue of the paper. So that you can take it back to, to the record. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very specific thing that caused him to want to break from the church later on. 
But a lot of his teachers at the University of Paris and other places were, in fact, Lutherans. And he was a very, he had a very good Latin style. His Latin prose was excellent. He was uh, very much in love with the classics. And, his, and again, the, a lot of the teachers were Lutherans. So that was a, certainly a source of Lutheran doctrines. So he gets a, um, you know, eventually at a certain point, he breaks from the church. He writes a pamphlet called, oops, wrong way. The Institutes of Christian Religion. Now, this is the later book. The <coughs> earlier book was just a pamphlet. Later, he starts expounding upon it so that it goes up to 80 chapters from an original 16. By the time he's done with it, which is the fruit of his thought over the years. And so to get through a lot of the information faster, we'll more or less summarize where, um, you know, what the composing of this book is probably in the history of European civilization. This is probably one of the most important books that will ever be produced in terms of determining how the future of life, religion, and politics will play out, in, especially in Northern Europe. So the Institutes start divided into four books, and the word book in the Renaissance, just like in the Roman times, was basically the, the subject in which something was treated on. And then the heading with the caput, the head, would be like, would we, our word chapter, that's what it means. It's the heading uh, in that subject that the book is on. So the word, whereas our word book is kind of has, embodies a different meaning from what they meant. It. So that's why you'll see, like, especially in like, St. <coughs> Augustine, you're reading Church Fathers, it says, such and such work, book one, book two, book three. You're like, what are these books? That's why, because they're treating different, uh, different subjects mainly. So book one is the scriptures as the rule of faith. So he talks about the excellence of the scriptures, why tradition doesn't satisfy, why it has to be scripture alone, which is the rule. So he's imbibed a lot of Luther's teaching, but now what he's doing is organizing it, rejecting things out of Luther that didn't make sense, and reorganizing it amongst, you know, in, in his own thought, which is very disciplined. He's a lawyer. He was never a priest, and he was never um, a monk or anything. He was always a civil lawyer, and this all really plays out very heavily in the writing of the Institutes. Another part of the, the scriptures as the rule of faith is only the scriptures can be the rule of faith, and they carry absolute authority, but men still need to interpret them. So the interpreter of the Word of God, who's the clergyman, the presbyter, the elder, his job is to make this known to the people. You have to listen to him. You can't demur from that. So there's actually an authority. And we'll cover this in a minute uh, when we get done with this section. There's an authority that Calvin expects you to obey. A magisterium, as it were. So again, Calvin is very far removed from modern-day evangelicals who hold a very different idea. And if you can like to just talk to a Presbyterian about it, he'll give you a long laundry list of that sort of thing. Man does not have free will. All of our works are damnable. Christ imputes his merits to us. And Christ's office as priest, prophet, and king. So a lot of it's, uh, let's put, <coughs> is this working with original sin, uh, Christology, who Christ is, what he does, what his office is in, uh, you know, in, in the fulfilling scriptures. Okay, and justifying us because we can't be justified by anything but faith, because all of our works, so saying it again, the total depravity doctrine of Martin Luther, Calvin has imbibed it fully. Then we get the nature of faith. Faith regenerates us, faith alone justifies us. Christian freedom. What's Christian freedom? The freedom he's talking about here is the gospel makes us free from every work of the law. It's the only thing that Luther has. So the church cannot impose upon you fasting times of fasting. The church cannot impose upon you anything that's not found in explicitly laid out in scripture that you must do. It says at this certain time. So anything, any kind of canon law stuff the church lays out, ah, that's, that's a burden on our freedom. He goes in great length on those subjects, and especially in the next book we'll do that. Predestination. Every man has been predetermined now, Luther has this to a certain extent, but Calvin develops it further. Every man is determined to be in heaven or hell. God has already determined it, and everything we do on earth shows that we're part of the elect, and you can never know that. Except for Calvin. He knows. Because he has to. Because he's the one giving you quite the true godly teaching. Book four, this is the one, so for example, if you pick up uh, any of the translations of St. Robert Bellarmine in the back, when he addresses Calvin, it's almost always out of book four, because book four deals with the nature of the church, 
And of course, what is the true church for Calvin? And that the Catholic Church is not the true church. The Mass is a blasphemy that calls upon judgment on Christ, and that's why the Pope is the Antichrist. Papal primacy is a lie invented by the church. And those are all the things that Calvin expounds upon in Book 4. And a lot more things, too. So he takes on a number of Catholic doctrines. He answers a lot of objections that are brought from the church fathers. He also tries to anticipate a lot of objections, which is new. It's something Luther doesn't do in all of his works. Luther just expects you to obey what he says, or else you're a damnable work of the, of the Antichrist. For example, we saw above Zwingli, right? Zwingli and Luther didn't disagree, so we saw that painting at Woodcut of Zwingli dead in the Swiss cantons, making war on the Catholic cities, and he died in battle. And Luther was jubilant when he heard that. He thought it was the greatest thing ever. And he praised, uh, you know, he said that, oh, God knows how to deal with them, doesn't he? <laughs> he knows how to deal with his, uh, his enemies, because they were opposed to me, so therefore they must be my enemies. They mean they're for God's enemies. So, it's God took care of it. And uh, a similar thing here, you know, goes on here. Right? Calvin understands that the church is the enemy. I am the one, the, the one in the right, and everyone opposed to us is Antichrist. And that even includes uh, other, you know, Lutherans, Anabaptists, others. We'll see how that goes. Calvin on the interpretation of Scripture. This is the money quote. We admit, therefore, that ecclesiastical pastors are to be heard just like Christ himself. As in, I've, got, I've gotten rid of that other magisterium, which I've shown to be antichrist, and now I tell you, you must accept my magisterium. And he does. So Calvin takes over in uh, Geneva, eventually, and runs it like a little dictator, more or less. And we'll cover that in just a minute. Le Fadi Placard. So the placards affair in Paris, I, I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry if you speak French, I don't speak it well. Actually, I don't speak it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so the affair of the placards, so King Francois I over here, uh, so he was, the, he's the one, for example, who brought da Vinci to Paris. In fact, a lot of dissolute Italian artists that were wanted for some crime or another, he usually invited to come up to, to Paris. And that's how Da Vinci rolls up the Mona Lisa and takes it with him. And that's why it's in the Louvre and not in some museum in Italy. The, um, he also gets the goldsmith Cellini, who's wanted a number of very violent crimes in Rome, but uh, comes up to Paris and Francois says, oh, if you do obey, you know, obey the law and don't uh, make a mess of yourself up here, I'll make you very rich. It'll be great. And that's more or less what happens. So he's not really interested in theological arguments. He's mostly interested in when he's going to make War on Charles V next, whether he's going to try to make an alliance with Henry VIII as the power broker between the two to tip the scales, or whether he's going to you know, go it alone on his own and fight both Henry and Charles again. And that's really the, the only focus that he's got for most of his life. And then this whole business shows up. I couldn't find any good pictures of the event. So Calvin, inspired by the new gospel teaching that is true, to go and attack Antichrist, he goes to Paris, and he sets up signs all over the place, blaspheming the Blessed Sacrament, blaspheming relics, blaspheming the Mass, blaspheming processions, attacking all the church laws on fasting, right? attacking the Pope, the Pope's the Antichrist. Again, this, this line, right? which now really becomes the ecumenical doctrine of all Protestantism, whether you're Anabaptist or a Calvinist, or a Lutheran, or a Zwinglian, or you're of any type of strife in between, and even later on, the Pope's the Antichrist. That's the one thing they all agree on, almost by necessity. It's an ups the ante to such an extent, where you can never go back over to Antichrist. So all over Paris, they set up these placards, these signs. Sometimes bits of paper scrawled over a church door. Sometimes wooden signs set up right in front of a church in a town square or whatever else. The people wake up to go to Mass on Sunday morning, and they see all these side blasphemies against the Blessed Sacrament. So this angers Parisian Catholics, big time. Why? Parisian Catholics are not lawyers. A lot of them are not intellectuals. A lot of them are just artisans and craftsmen. They don't really understand what Calvin's trying to get across. Calvin's hoping to show the, the more intellectuals what a superstition all these things are. And the average people, they don't buy into it because what matters to them? It's not scholastic propositions at the University of Paris. It's not even catechism, they barely know it. What matters to them are masses, processions, 
relics, all the very things that Calvin's just blasphemed. The saints' days, the saints whom they are named after, all of these mattered French Catholics. And Calvin's little, you know, uh, scribbles on the paper are outrages against what they hold dear. And that's why in, in Paris, there is a universal hatred of Calvinism that lasts all the way up until the French Revolution. So Calvinism is never able to get a foothold. We'll see more of that tomorrow, actually. Um, so France kind of holds to. So Francois, is the pressure comes on him, because he's known about Calvinists in, in uh, France. They come to be called Huguenots, and we'll talk more about them tomorrow. So he sees their presence in France. He sees something's got to be done. He kind of drags his feet. And then they fare the placards have people demand action. So Francois gets in and starts burning various Calvinists or those known to be of Calvinist opinions in the University of Paris. At the university, there was a, a Basque student who was studying there and who would want uh, Francis Cohabia one day to be St. Francis Xavier, as we say, and uh, the great missionary to the Indies. Well, at the time, he realized that his buddy Ignatius that uh, was, was helping him out and giving him money, he really loved his soul and wanted him to get to heaven. All the people he took for his friends were Calvinists that are now being burned during this action. He realized they tended to the destruction of his soul. And then he takes on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius to become more firmly committed to Christ, which um, is largely a result of this. Anabaptists, so this name you hear once in a while. Anabaptists are essentially the anarchists of the day as far as religion goes. And what they are is it's basically the, the predecessors of our modern evangelicals. And in fact, especially in their English exponents, they'll be the progenitors of the thought that we kind of take for granted as Western thought, right? In, in, in democracy, in Western civilization since uh, the French Revolution and the American Revolution, that all the thought that makes those events really comes from the Anabaptists. So who are they? They kind of start in random places, and it's much too complicated a story to get down to all the essentials. The name Anabaptist was given to them by their enemies, principally by Calvinists and Lutherans who hated them. So the Anabaptists did not believe in infant baptism. They would not do it. They didn't believe baptism was a sacrament that it regenerated you. They believed it was just a symbol. Christ said to do it, so therefore we're going to do it. They really don't know why. It's a fun time to get out of the pool. <laughs> And so then, the, um, they also varied in their doctrines. Some were anti-Trinitarian, and at the time that was called Unitarian. There's actually a formal name for that, it's called Sicinian, uh, which comes from a priest named Sicinius who denied the Trinity. And then the, um, right, so, the, so Unitarians were one group, anti-Sacramentarians were another, and sometimes they believed that the end, that the end times were coming. And so in Holland, for example, there was a man named John, John Leyden. And so he established the Munster Rebellion, where the Anabaptists took over this one city and established this Anabaptist commune. And then the, at the head of it is John Leyden himself, and he ends up taking for himself 16 wives. <laughs> he has uh, all the people are forced to this miserable drudgery basically to serve the upper class of Anabaptists, basically a communist dictatorship uh, of sorts that, he, that they set up. And the horrors that go on there are so terrible that you know everyone, so Protestants, whether Lutheranism or, or Lutherans or Calvins or various independent stripes of them, or Catholics, or the local rulers, all realize these guys are a problem. And so wherever they're found, they're killed because they are basically anarchists against the state, against the church. Doesn't matter which church it happens to be. And so Luther and Calvin both have a hatred for the Anabaptists. Calvin has many of them burned. Uh, Edward VI in England, Protestant, young Protestant, son of Henry VIII, he has Anabaptists burned. More so than Queen Mary did. Most of the Protestants burned by Queen Mary, we'll talk about that more tomorrow, um, they are Anabaptists. Right? Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, right? who's you know, good Queen Bess, really more like Bloody Bess, she doesn't just have Catholics hanged around the quarter, she has Anabaptists burned at the stake. Elizabeth has Anabaptists burned at the stake, a good number of them. So they, they, wherever they went, they were not liked. And that's why so many of them formed what became known as the Puritan movement in England. Although not all Puritans were Anabaptists, by the way. They just all get lumped together. They end up being largely what we call independents, because they don't believe there should be an established state church like there would be in England, even though they're Protestants. So then they go to Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts and wreak their havoc over there. 
where they again set up a communist sort of commune, <laughs> where all property is communal, and if you guys are the head of it, it falls apart, they have to completely restructure it. But anyway, so just to know, when you hear Anabaptists, and so today, the modern-day Baptists are very much related to them, even though they try to deny the association. They're not quite, actually, they're much more family-oriented than the original Anabaptists, but uh, for the most part, but at the same time, their doctrines are just about the same. Okay. So the idea, no church structure, no authority, no, I, I, my Bible talks to me and that's all I need, right? That's not the religion of Calvin or Luther. They believe in the structured magisterium where they are in charge and the people they institute. So the Presbyters' Councils, that's why we talk about Presbyterianism. And that's why Calvin is so important, ultimately, is that the Presbyters, that's the councils of learned elder clergy that expound the word of God to the faithful, right? That system is carried over to Scotland. That becomes a very important philosophy, even in England. That's what becomes dominant over in this country. And when you look at England and, and the United States, determining much of the future of the world, that some of the ideas and doctrines that come through that are heavily influential. Calvinism itself isn't like Lutheranism, which is restricted to wherever the monarch becomes a Lutheran. It's the same Presbyterianism in Switzerland, in the Huguenots in France, in, in Holland, and in England and Scotland. Same idea. Okay, England. Everyone knows about this, so we'll make a, a, a quick run through it. So Henry decides my wife is too fat. She, <laughs> she has failed as royal baby name. And now, you know, warning, because basically Catherine, who was extremely pretty and was madly in love with, when he was a boy at the time, and had to give her away to his older brother, Arthur. Now that the Henry is in his 30s, she has been perpetually pregnant since the time that they were married in uh, 1509. So it, this is born very badly. A lot of them stillbirths, right? Her, her history here was not very good, unfortunately. Her health was very bad in the way of uh, pregnancy. So it, a lot of miscarriages. So Catherine, unfortunately, worn out by it, loses her figure, and Henry's no longer really he still has a lot of respect for it, but he's mostly spending his time with the, uh, the more attractive model, you know, the, next, uh, the next car he wants to trade in. So at some point, he's just stopping. Why am I married to this woman? The whole dynastic reasoning was the alliance with the Spanish, right? in this case meaning Charles V now. Right? That imperial alliance, which turned out to give him absolutely nothing. They were supposed to make joint war on the French. And Charles kind of didn't do anything, didn't do anything. And then finally, when he won against Charles, he basically told Henry, yeah, you know what, I have everything I need now. I don't need you anymore. I'm going to not pay the money I promised you, and I'm going to not get Colonel Wolsey elected pope. And I'm not going to marry your daughter either that I'm betrothed to. So I'm going to uh, just say goodbye, Henry. They'll work it out again later. But in the meantime, Henry's mad. Why, why am I married here? There's no reason for this. So he needs to find a way to get out of it. And that's the annulment proceedings come on. Not divorce. Nobody divorced in England until about 1689. And even Henry, all his mar marriages, he never divorced. Not once. So it was always annulled or on the grounds of non-consummation or, or, well, there's the other solution. Right? In, the case, <laughs> in the case of three of his wives. So, or two of his wives. Uh, so before I move on, so Henry sets up this uh, court and Wolsey is supposed to be the judge, and one of his own nobles of the bedchamber, Henry is all rehearsed, planned, comes and accuses Henry of having, you know, lived adulterously with a woman that is not his wife because she, the marriage was invalid, because really she is his brother's widow. And what does that mean now? In the book of Leviticus, there is a special line. Anyone who marries his brother's wife is an unclean thing and shall be bar uh, barren. What they're talking about is called affinity which is different from kinship. Affinity is when someone is married to your kin, right? And so an in-law. And that's something that had to be dispensed against by ecclesiastical law. Now, in the Old Testament, that's there. Now, the way that they used to read it in those times was in that legislative law that one is part of the Jewish ceremonial law. Other people said, no, this looks like it's more of divine law. But then you have Deuteronomy that says to marry your brother's widow and raise up children in his name. Well, what do we do here? So this, this question is a big theological question. So Cardinal Wolsey goes to the best theologian of the day, to St. John Fisher. And he uh, says to St. John Fisher, yeah, there's somebody who has this problem. 
John Fisher's not cool. Nobody's <laughs> down. It's really going on. And uh, anyway, so they, so John Fisher explains to him what the church fathers do. They put both verses from Leviticus and Deuteronomy together. That normally the affinity is such you shouldn't marry your brother's wife, but if he's childless, then you should. And that's how the church fathers would have read it, and that would solve the problem. Now the church, on the other hand, the way, the way the posthumously, just as a little footnote, has looked at it. No, it was just affinity as ecclesiastical law, and what the church has done is removed all the canons dealing with affinity. So now you only have to deal with direct relation within the fourth degree. Right? And that's the only thing the church mitigates against now by law. So no, no more affinity. So you know, Henry's case wouldn't even need a dispensation to marry Catherine to begin with if it was done today. Actually, we probably shouldn't talk about what would happen if Henry's case was done today. But uh, <laughs> it's very, very, very different. So Fisher then, you know, realizes what's up and he starts doing some investigation. So Henry is play, employing a lot of chican chicanery. So he wants Wolsey to basically produce the case in England and, and judge it and finish it. So Wolsey's about to do it and he stops. Something hit Wolsey because Cardinal Wolsey had run England um, and the picture's right there. Uh, this Cardinal Compeggio, the papal league, we'll get to the legatine court. Wolsey had run England more or less on his own, and Henry had gone hunting and played games and done what he wanted, and every once in a while would do state functions and get involved in the, the messy business of state, because Wolsey got Henry everything he wanted. So Wolsey stopped his priorities as the Pope's official legate in England came. He said, what if I'm overruled? Or worse, what if I'm wrong and I stand before divine judgment? He, everything else I've done, I don't know, a good confession. This, this is so big. Wow. I better send this one to Pope. No way it's on his end. And so he does. So he revokes the case to Rome. And this is in 1527. Unbeknownst to Wolsey, Charles V's armies have sacked Rome because the Pope decided to ally with the French at the last minute. Charles won, and Charles said to Pope Clement VII, that just wasn't a good idea. So he sends his army to threaten them. He doesn't pay them. They get mad. So they said, hey, we should take the whole city. And they do. It's a horrible disaster. So Charles now, on the other hand, the Pope's fled to Castel Sant'Angelo, and Charles is like, well, never let a crisis go to waste. Pope is fully, you know, uh, besieged by my troops. He's going to do what I say. So Wolsey's now looking at this. That appeal is not going to be favorably heard by the Pope. Well, eventually he does escape, Clement VII, and to French protection, and then he eventually does agree to allow Wolsey to try this case. And he gives Compeggio a special brief because then he realized this was a big mistake and I shouldn't have done it. So he gives to Cardinal Compeggio, his official legate at the trial, a brief that says that you can allow the case to go on, you can allow all the arguments to be heard, but you're gonna have to call the case back to my judgment at any point where it seems like something could happen. And that's essentially what Compeggio does. Now one of the things that happens during the trial is you have this scene here, which is actually depicting Shakespeare's King Henry VIII, which is taken verbatim from William Rastell's account of this trial. He was a contemporary <coughs> of Thomas More, and he watched everything that happened. So Henry then, you know, is uh, <clears throat> you know, declaring, of course, he's always respected Catherine, and she goes on a long appeal. Haven't I for 30 years been your loyal wife? Haven't I you know, born you a daughter and always been faithful? And then Shakespeare records it in very great detail. It's worth seeing there. And uh, without further ado, she left and all the crowds cheered. She, everyone supported her. Everyone hated Anne Boleyn, right? It was the reason behind Henry's thinking here. Anne Boleyn comes to court as a real dynamo. At some point, Henry notices her, sexy rather than beautiful, intriguing uh, intellectually, and someone that, that really stoked up his passions when he wanted her to become his mistress, and she said no. Only someone like that could say no to a kid. And that, that just made him go nuts. Like, wow. That's incredible. I'm in love again, right? And, and it's not actually happening that way. But so that's the it's the motivation behind Henry. It's not just a matter of mistress. It's a matter of love now, at least as he perceives it. And so we could go on a lot about this. I gave a presentation on this last year, which uh, Census Fidelia put up, which you can see. Uh, so I don't want to go too much into it. Oops, actually, Fisher stands up. It makes a great intervention for the queen, citing canon law, citing uh, precedents, moral law, theology, in such a way where everyone's kind of shocked that he would get up as he knew he would incur the, Henry's displeasure. And uh, he did. And Henry didn't want to get rid of Fisher by any means possible at that point, but he couldn't. And the legatine court eventually, because it had no evidence to conclusively show that you know Henry and Catherine's marriage was invalid, 
They, uh, you know, uh, Campeggio takes his opportunity. He uh, adjourns the court and never meets again. So this puts St. Thomas More into a very difficult position. So he, Wolsey is booted out of the chancellorship. He's no longer going to be in charge of the state. And he has to go retire back to York, where he's going to eventually face a treason trial by Henry, as soon as Henry can get a nice trumped up kangaroo court ready for him. And in the meantime, he makes more the Lord High Chancellor, and he wants Henry, Henry wants more to get moving on his divorce policy. So this is a big problem for more. He's not in favor of it. He actually supports Catherine. So he tells Henry point blank what he thinks. He'll listen to the arguments of the other side, and he'll help him as much as he feels he can in conscience. And he won't gainsay the case either, but he's not going to support it if he doesn't see the grounds for it. And of course, and he didn't. So, and, but this was still became an embarrassment for Henry. As people would ask him his opinion, he wouldn't say anything. And people would draw the obvious conclusion that war is not in for all of this. And although he was a very successful Lord Chancellor, in the meantime, what Moore is doing mostly is suppressing Protestantism as it's coming into England. And this is where all the stuff about Henry's marriage now suddenly becomes relevant in the context of the Reformation. In Luther and Germany, Lutheranism was imposed. And once it was imposed, faithful monks left and found Catholic areas. Less than faithful went and got married. The uh, church property was looted by all the local nobles and people enriched themselves. And this was supposed to be a great attraction for why you might want to become Protestant. For England, this is a big danger because there's, the church is extremely wealthy in England. And more is seeing all this new Protestant stuff coming into England, usually Lutheran tracts that are being translated into English. And the biggest threat of all was from this fellow named William Tyndale. Tyndale is the first modern translator, early modern translator of the Bible. And in fact, most of the King James is borrowed from William Tyndale's work. King James Bibles borrowed from this. So this is an original Tyndale print. And Tyndale was a scholar. He was a school teacher. He was very good uh, in languages, especially Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And so he put, he was a genius at writing in English. He wrote a very good, very fluent English. So eventually he becomes convinced of Lutheran ideas. We still don't know how from the history. And he flees to Germany, where he starts working, finishing up his Bibles. He was trying to do it in England. And because he was illegal in England, he had to flee. So he starts translating the Bible. And then he hears that the Archbishop of Mainz is, is made an advanced order for all of his Bibles. And, and why would the Catholic Archbishop buy up Tyndale's heretical Protestant Bibles? And in a language that nobody there could read, the answer is very simple. He wants to burn them all. <laughs> so Tyndale says, what an idiot. This is great. Everyone is going to hate the bishop for what he's done for burning the Bible. I'm going to have enough money to print a new and better edition, and I could start, and I'll even have my money left over to smuggle it all in England. That's exactly what he does with this edition right here. And the bishop he, he took a lot of opprobrium for burning the Bible. And uh, so Tyndale remained a very controversial figure in England. So these Bibles would be smuggled into England. And read of one of the things, again, just like the problems with the King James Bible and other Protestant translations, is that they change certain elements of the language in such a way as to deny Catholic doctrine. Tyndale's was even worse. Even Henry, when he mentioned he did go Protestant, was, or mostly, at least in a certain respect, anyway, still had problems with Tyndale's Bible because it's got footnotes against the authority of kings because it was under the authority of Henry that Tyndale was suffering. And so he has this very, um, ironically, Catholic, very early medieval Catholic notion of kingship, where the limitations on kings, and without realizing it's a Catholic idea. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, he uh, gets, gets in a lot of trouble, and he eventually gets burned in the Netherlands for promoting Protestant doctrines there. But one of his effects was to translate Lutheran treatises into English and set him over. And Thomas More's job was writing confutations of heresies which uh, we're fairly successful at. But the situation in England changes with this man, Thomas Cramer, who's heavily influenced by Lutheran ideas. And he's kind of your perfect court archbishop. So he, whatever Henry needs done, is done. <clears throat> so, and he, he is uh, Anne Boleyn's chaplain. He comes from an obscure family, he's a Cambridge Don. And because he's in Anne Boleyn's circle, she introduces him to Henry. And so when the whole legatine court has failed, it doesn't look like anything's going to come from the Pope. Kramer comes in. No. I don't see Popes in the Bible. Do you see Popes in the Bible? I don't see a Pope in the Bible. I see kings. I see bishops. I see popes. 
And you know what I also see is this verse in Leviticus. So maybe you've been going about this all wrong. Maybe the verse in Leviticus can't be dispensed against, not because of the affinity, but because it's scripture and it can't be dispensed against. It's higher than the Pope, who's just a bishop of Rome anyway. So Henry, remember 10 years earlier, Thomas More didn't believe the Pope was, was a divine institution, and Henry did. Now it's turning the opposite. Henry's convinced by this. Yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And that's why things aren't going my way, because, I mean, what God wants is what I want, right? And Henry really believed that, just as much as the Protestant reformers did. So, yeah, I want to marry Anne Boleyn, and that's obviously what God wants, because I'm the king. So, you're right, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> More, on the other hand, had been convinced of the Pope's divine authority, because he, he realized he didn't have enough skill to answer the Protestant heretics. So he read St. John Fisher, who did, who had answered Luther, and he read the copious patristic testimony in favor of Petrine primacy, and More was converted, <laughs> whereas Henry went the other way. Another figure that comes into it is Thomas Cromwell. Again, not enough time to talk about him with any decent job. Cromwell also, is, during his time of service in Italy, comes into contact with a number of Lutheran exiles and picks up Lutheran doctrine from them, which then he goes and cultivates at Cambridge with the hidden Lutherans there. Cromwell becomes, he's uh, actually part of Cardinal Wolsey's entourage, and he survived Wolsey's fall becomes Henry's secretary of letters, and at some point, Henry discovers how sharp the guy's mind is. So, first he says, what you need is to craft an act, because uh, <coughs> Anne anyway, right? Because Cranmer basically now, because at some point Anne had given in to Henry, now she's pregnant, and the marriage has to happen quick. So Cromwell, not Cromwell, Cranmer, is made the new Archbishop of Canterbury, and he basically declares the old marriage of Henry and Anne invalid, or, uh, sorry, Catherine, the marriage of Henry and Anne Valid, and that, you know, you're now faithfully married. <clears throat> Cromwell says, there's only one way to fix it, make this work, make it stick. You need an act of succession. You need a law that says it. This is actually the world supremacy, but it's written in a similar style. You need a law that says, I swear that Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII are truly and validly married, and Henry and Catherine were not. That's what has to be done. Otherwise, people will be able to fight and attack it. People like um, two holiest men of the kingdom that will inspire others. We don't want that. So Cromwell crafts the, the act of succession, and Fisher and Moore both will only agree to it on the on the one part, which is where it says that Henry and Anne's issue will be the succession. That is, their kids get to succeed the throne, not the issue of Henry and Catherine. But they wouldn't accept the preamble which declared Henry's marriage to, to Catherine invalid because it was a subtle denial of papal infallibility. They couldn't do it. So Henry stuck him in the tower. Right? And then there were some others, Cartusians too, who were martyred and refused to go along with it all. And ultimately then you have this act, the act of royal supremacy, which is what this one was, where you must swear that the king in his person, his royal person, is truly the head of the Church of England, Ecclesia Anglicana and that this is an ancient privilege of English kings. And that anybody who maliciously denies it in thought is a traitor, is guilty of treason, and can be executed then as a traitor forthwith. So now the task was to show that Fisher and Moore had actually attacked, gained save the royal supremacy maliciously in thoughts or in word. And of course, they were keeping tight-lipped. They weren't saying anything. So they weren't hastening to martyrdom, martyrdom but they weren't going to uh, deny it either. They were just doing what they felt unconscious to be the right thing to do. So eventually they trip him up. If you've seen A Man for All Seasons, you see the trick that was used, uh, attempted to be used in Thomas More, it was done to John Fisher. And so and this is one of the reasons why you don't see any treatises from Fisher addressing John Calvin, is because Henry put him to the axe before he could ever get a chance to read any of Calvin's work. So Fisher, uh, was formally condemned at a trial by after you know, the testimony of a certain Richard Rich. If you remember that from Man for All Seasons. So he tried the same trick on, uh, he did the same trick on Fisher that he tried on Moore. He just did a little bit earlier. Fisher, not being so streetwise, fell for it. And then they came in court and said, no, oh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if I swore an oath. You uh, denied the king's royal supremacy, so you get to die. Fisher produced a singular miracle that he never produced in life, namely that when his, uh, after he was beheaded, 
His head was put on a spike on London Bridge, and it produced the smell of roses, this fragrant smell. Now, if you think of 1535 London, the, uh, the horses, as they go, they leave something behind. And uh, there's no, there's no uh, indoor plumbing, and so you have to leave all that behind in the street, usually. And you see a lot of old paintings. You see people wearing these wooden clogs of sorts, right? And those are basically wooden shoes, so their actual shoes wouldn't get the excrement that's lying in the streets on their shoes. So that's, and of course, London Bridge is also strewn with it, too. You pay people big bucks at night, you try to clean it away, and it's all back the next day. And so, in the midst of all this muck, you have Fisher's head exuding the smell of roses. And it's so pungent, so pronounced, everyone notices, and everyone knows exactly what it means. It's a judgment against Henry. So Henry orders uh, Fisher's head to be thrown into the Thames to make room for Mr. Moore. And you've seen the trial in the Man for All Seasons. Substantially, the, sub the substance is, is there, is basically what happens. So he replaces uh, Fisher on the spike. And they die, basically, as martyrs for the church, for the authority of the Pope. And they're killed because they thought, contrary to the king's will. Right? So actually, the Thomas More book on the table back there I sold to a uh, libertarian friend of mine, and I said, see, here's a politician who's killed for thought crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Henry goes on, so he marries Anne Boleyn, and Anne is very much a Protestant opinion. Henry's still Catholic. He wants to keep the church Catholic without the Pope. He still believes in the sacraments. He still believes in everything the way he had it before, except the, the, the papacy. They were going to cut that out. So eventually, Anne prevails upon Henry to release the Bible in English. This would increase his authority. And Henry's like, no, we're not going to do that. There's a chance for real authority. So we have the Henry VIII authorized edition of the Bible, first authorized edition of the Bible, and the features, actually, let's get a close-up of that, a very larger-than-life Henry VIII and a teeny little Jesus. Who's the lawgiver? The king. The king. This king specifically, Henry VIII, if we backtrack, so you have... Catholics in prison, and uh, actually, I forgot where it was. You have Anabaptists being hung somewhere around, hanged and drawn somewhere around here. Uh, I forget where in the woodcut, unless it's only part of the woodcut. <laughs> but uh, everyone shouts, Viva Rex! Along with the king, Viva Rex, right? And so that everyone's receiving this Bible happily. And But if uh, you don't receive it, this is where you can expect to go. Right? Not such a good. Uh, Good of the thing. So, we get the close up. So, Henry's under no illusion as to who rules in his kingdom. It's not Christ. Anne Boleyn is very satisfied with this, and she thinks she's doing great stuff until she runs afoul of Henry. She did not make the transition from royal queen, from royal mistress to royal queen. A queen needs to be subservient, and a mistress can afford certain amounts of dalliance. She was not a subservient queen, and so her and Henry had it out. They fought in public, and she uh, accused him of lacking virile prowess. Mm -hmm. So he, after that, that was it. So he had to find something. He went to Cramer. What do I do? Surely we can fix what, and you know, and all that was impossible. There's no way to do it because the whole drama of the kingdom for seven years was that he was passionately in love with Anne and needed to marry her. And now there's no way to annul that. So Cramer instead backs out and lets the experts take over. So Cromwell comes in. The next thing you know, Anne is arrested on charges of high treason. She's charged with having incest with her brother and affairs with men, all of which almost all historians acknowledge to be trumped up and ridiculous. The, um, so her brothers are executed. She's executed. Now, back then, for a queen to commit adultery was treasonous. For the husband, well, the king, and then, no, by the way, I'm not approving this. This is their thinking. The king, well, you know, he has his little bit of business here and there. And then if, it, if a bastard's produced an illegitimate child, oh well, you know, maybe he recognizes it, maybe he doesn't, doesn't matter. But the queen, what if a changeling is introduced via her adultery? What if you have the issue is not really from the king? You could have civil wars, you could have all kinds of problems. So that's why the queen can never commit adultery. The king can, of course, but not the queen. So Anne is beheaded, and the next day, Henry marries Jane Seymour. <laughs> who follows the same road as Anne prior to the beheading, namely that Henry wanted her to become his mistress. He says, and she says no, and Henry's like, oh, I love that feeling. Right, we'll go through it all over again. So, 
Jean Meldo becomes the good wife. She gives him his son. Okay? But she's also Catholic, and she still has some attachments to the old religion and to the papacy. So now his real wife, Catherine of Aragon, has died of natural causes, although probably aggravated by Henry's harsh treatment, but still natural causes. <coughs> and his pretend wife is dead. Oops. And his pretend wife is dead. And Jane is Catholic. There's nothing that stops Henry from rejoining the church. Except now he's the richest monarch in Europe because he's assembled almost all church lands unto himself. So this monument tells the story of why Henry does not become Catholic again. Why he doesn't go back to the Pope, even though he could. And probably because of the dangers of schism and heresy, the Pope would forgive everything. Why doesn't he do it? The monument asks, there's Henry VII, Henry's father, his mother. In the background, there's Henry, there's Jane Seymour, even though by the time this portrait was painted, it's several years since she was dead of natural causes, childbirth, actually. Who is the greater, the father or the son? The one who ended war or the one who brought true religion? And the monument doesn't fail to notice the son who's brought true religion is the greatest of these. Why? Because it makes me darn rich. After a jousting accident, though, Henry and his doctors didn't allow him to get out anymore. So Henry, unfortunately, <laughs> has one more thing to do. And thus, the fat Henry of legend, the Henry, the tyrannical Henry, the murderous Henry, is now, you know, is now finally fixed in reality. Whereas before that, he was at one time a pious Catholic king, very thin, very handsome. Not anymore. <laughs> And lastly, just as an epilogue, Henry's wife, so Jane Seymour dies in childbirth, giving birth to his only son, Edward VI. So after several years of brooding, Cromwell says, hey, you need to marry again. So they send the painter, Holbein, off to a uh, Protestant house in Germany, where they find Anne of Cleves. And at first, Henry likes the portrait. But then when he actually meets her, she doesn't, he, he, it doesn't work. He just doesn't um, find her attractive at all. And so he, uh, annuls the marriage for non-consummation. So that is declaring it to be an invalid marriage altogether. And so, it, so it never happened because he never consummated. And her testimony was sufficient to prove that. Uh, although, yeah, I mean, we don't have enough time. Catherine Howard is a woman with a past. So Henry meets her, wants to marry her, and she's beautiful and young. And by this time, Henry's very large, very fat, not particularly attractive. But she gets to be the queen. So she goes along with all this business. And, but she still has affairs and lovers. Thomas Culpepper, for instance, which she'd known since she was about 16. So Catherine Howard is put to the sword. She's executed. Uh, so we can't do that. And the very last wife is Catherine Parr, who uh, continues the education of Henry's children, which is Mary and Elizabeth. We haven't mentioned them. We'll mention them much more tomorrow. And the, la the nail in the coffin for England is the suppression of the monasteries. All the wealth of the church largely is kept in the monastic communities, and mostly they were giving it back to the people. So the monastic communities would return wealth by giving tenant ships to people who were homeless or just travelers. People who didn't have work, they could get a tenancy in the monastic lands. They would raise up uh, food, give some to the monastery, and then be able to raise animals that they could sell at the market and keep the money for themselves and better themselves, right? The monastic schools provided free education from whence a lot of people, like Herbert Wolsey, for example, came through the ranks and learned Latin and got their eventual positions and their jobs. All of this gets suppressed by Henry, and it really is the thing that becomes the end of Catholic England. It is the big sticking point why even the Catholic nobles at the, return, at the time of Queen Mary are not keen on returning to the church, because that means we might have to give the land back. Because when the Protestant lords were, were um, ransacking the monasteries and the churches, the Catholic lords joined in, because we can't let them get rich without us. Edward VI was Henry's son, and whereas Henry was Catholic, and his reign was largely schismatic, Edward's is formally Protestant, formally heretical, where Henry said, I can keep the church Catholic without the Pope, I can keep right doctrine. Edward says, you know, we're going to get real doctrine. As a young boy, very precocious, raised and educated by Cramer himself in matters of religion. And which is largely Calvinist, right? So the bar is shifting. Even though Cranmer was originally a Lutheran, the Institutes of Christian Religion have been devised. People who are akin to Calvin's thought, like Martin Bucer 
and Henry Bullinger, very two other Protestant reformers, come to England and they help Cranmer structure the new church. And part and parcel of the whole thing is the Book of Common Prayer. And so this, eventually after a lot of tri tries and misfires, this gets produced. So this is the reduction of the Mass and the sacraments to the simpler form. So there was two. So there's this 1549 prayer book. This is the original one. And this was seen, especially by many of the Protestants, like Booster, as being far too Catholic. People receiving communion at the altar rails, this is a blasphemy. Booster says that this is not just a remnant of the old church. This shows the ministerial priesthood that the priest feeds the people. We can't have that. This all has to go. The people have to stand as a sign that they, too, exercise a common priesthood with the minister. I'm not going to stop to draw too many implications out of that one. So this goes away, and they get the 1553 prayer book. And this causes revolts in Wales and other places of England and brings to a, you know, a crisis, the monarchy, because the rebels are very strong out in Essex and these other areas, uh, counties, and this could have spread. Nobody likes the new prayer book. There's a lot of priests hiding that are still saying mass in secret, right? that won't conform to the new religion. Even fixtures of Henry VIII's reign, like Stephen Gardner, who had defended the case of the divorce from, from uh, Catherine. It was very much you know, Henry's man in many matters. Gardner won't go along with the new book because he's more of a Henry man. And then, of course, once Mary comes to the throne, he'll revert to the Catholic faith. But in the meantime, he can't accept the privilege. So this is a big problem for uh, Edward VI, and he and his privy council want it crushed. And they do, and they end up bringing in foreign mercenaries to crush their own people and put an end to the rebellion, made a good number of martyrs in the Midland counties and amongst the Welsh and the Cornish and others that declare it will have the mass, it will have it in Latin, even as our fathers had it. And they wouldn't take any take the new prayer service. So it's a really amazing story. There's a good talk on YouTube by Michael Davis who tells the story in very great detail, all the major names and figures, the chronological events arranged, which is far beyond our scope because we just don't have the time. So unless I'm mistaken, that's the last slide. It is. So anyway, so tomorrow, <clears throat> so the consequence of where Europe is at the end, so just to summarize, we've seen how Luther starts, so using the abuses in the church as an excuse to be, begin pushing his heretical theology and justification, led to the political tumults in the Holy Roman Empire that allowed the establishment of Protestantism as a legal civil force, right? And then there are other, other things, the influence worldwide of these ideas leads to eventually other reformers to Calvin, whose influence extends far beyond that, and how this changes the scene, and very few are capable of responding. The only one that was really capable was St. John Fisher, really, and then uh, John.